Welcome back, Rave Readers. If you're watching this video, then that means that you have chosen to read along with me as I read Finding the Titanic. Now, this book is a um, realistic book. Um, it's considered a nonfiction book. All of the photographs are real or either realistic um, recreations based on historical events. Um, so some of the pictures that are in the book are from the movie, The Titanic, and um, but they are based on the true story. And this book is written by the um, discoverer of the sunken Titanic, Robert D. Ballard. So on the cover, you can see um, the remains and what is under, you know, under the sea of the Titanic. And I know some of you are really interested in this topic, which is why I chose to read this book, because I know a lot of you um, have read other Titanic books before. And so this one is a little bit different than the other videos that we have on the channel. Since it is considered a nonfiction book um, with the real photographs, um, this is the only nonfiction book that we have in the channel as of right now. So if you would like to see more, shoot me a comment or do leave a book review if you're watching this from our virtual library. Um, and let me know that you would like to see more books like this. So we're going to go ahead and get right in. Um, this, as you see, is a level four advanced reader. Um, so... This one's going to be a little bit longer, lots of facts and lots of information, but I hope it's one that everybody finds interesting. So this is written by Robert D. Ballard, the discoverer of the Titanic, and it says the paintings were done by Ken Marshall. So all the some of the pictures in this book are actual paintings. Some are real photographs. Some are um, sets from the movie. Um, which were based on realistic events. So we're just going to go ahead and get right into it. Chapter 1, August 25th, 1985. I went to the control center of our ship. Have you seen anything yet? I asked my team. I looked at the video screen. Nothing had appeared. We were searching for the Titanic, the most famous of all shipwrecks. The Titanic was once the largest ship in the world. It had grand rooms. It seemed like a floating palace. Some people even said the ship was unsinkable. But on its first voyage in April 1912, the Titanic hit an iceberg and sank. It was carrying over 2,000 people. Many of them died when the ship went down. Since this is a nonfiction book, we do have some captions to accompany our pictures. Um, so this is a real photograph. And it says, I watch as we lower Argo, our underwater camera sled. Um, another caption for our picture. Look, the captions are right underneath in the smaller print. This picture um, says, from the control center, I could see what Argo saw. So there's Robert D. Ballard in the control center, and then there's Argo. So it's kind of, it's got like a sub picture here, and then on the big picture. I had dreamed of finding the Titanic since I was a boy. No one had seen it in almost 75 years. It lay two and a half miles down on the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. This is far deeper than any diver can go. We built an underwater sled, Argo, to search for the ship. This sled took moving video pictures as it was pulled along just above the ocean floor. We watched these moving pictures on our ship's video screen. We began our search where the Titanic's lifeboats had been found by a rescue ship. For days, we pulled Argo along above the ocean bottom. Nothing appeared on our video screen but mud. I wondered if the ship had been buried by an underwater mudslide. I kept my eyes on the screen, but I thought about the people who survived the shipwreck. They told stories that will never be forgotten. Chapter 2, April 10th, 1912. It's so big, cried 12-year-old Ruth Becker. So here's a real photograph of the ship on the day it set sail in 1912. And then here's a photograph of one of the passengers on the Titanic when she got on the boat. The huge black hull of the Titanic sat in the docks at Southampton, England. The Becker family had been living in India, but now Ruth's brother was ill. Mrs. Becker decided to take her children back to America. 
So Mrs. Becker, Ruth, four-year-old Marion, and two-year-old Richard had sailed from India to England. Now they would board the Titanic for the trip to New York. Ruth could hardly wait to get on the beautiful new ship. Yellow letters on the bow proudly spelled out the name, Titanic. The Titanic was the largest ship afloat. It had nine decks, and it was as tall as an 11-story building. You could walk for miles along its decks and passageways. The Beckers boarded the Titanic, and a steward helped them find their cabin. This is just like a hotel room, Ruth said. Before the ship set sail, Ruth decided to explore. She climbed up the grand staircase. Gold-plated light fixtures hung from the ceiling. Sunlight shone through the big glass dome overhead. Ruth found the rooms of the wealthy first-class passengers. One of the doors was open. Ruth peeked inside. This room was bigger than her whole cabin. It was fancier, too. Ruth stepped into the elevator near the grand staircase. She went down as far as it would go. She discovered a swimming pool and steam baths. And then this picture, real-life photograph, of a second-class cabin like what Ruth's family would have stayed in. So on the Titanic, there were three cabins, uh, three styles of cabins. You had first class, which was your really wealthy. That's what we would call upper class today. And then you had your uh, middle class, so your second class, and then your third class, which would have been um, like we call we still call it lower class today or um, poverty level. That's like what we use as third class terms today. So just to kind of give you an idea of the terms that we use today. Um, versus what they used back then to kind of give you an idea of where you might have been. The hallways in the lower decks of the Titanic were crowded. Families carried large trunks and suitcases. Ruth heard many different languages. These were the third class passengers. Many of them were hoping to make new lives for themselves in America. A loud whistle sounded. Ruth hurried back to her cabin. It was noon, sailing time. She and her family went out onto the boat deck. Hundreds of passengers cheered as the Titanic pulled away from the dock. They waved to their friends on shore. There were even small boats waiting in the water. These boats were filled with people who wanted to see the biggest ship in the world set sail. So now we have a diagram that has different pictures labeled, and it has arrows pointing to the different things. So I'm just going to hold that up to the screen and let you take a look at that. You can see a swimming pool, and you can look and follow the arrow there. We have the grand staircase is the second one. And then we have the second class dining room. So just like everyone had their own cabin spaces, everybody also had their own dining room. So the wealthy um, upper class and the middle class or that second class did not even eat in the same dining rooms back then. Everybody had like their own menu and their own dining room. And then this is the second class cabin like the one we saw in the last picture where Ruth and her family would have been. For the first few days of the voyage, the weather was clear and the ocean was calm. The Beckers ate their meals in the second-class dining room. They sat at long tables with many other passengers. On Sunday afternoon, it became very cold. Ruth sat with her mother and some of the other passengers in the lounge. We're making good speed, one man said. We might even arrive to New York early if we don't run into ice. So I hear, said Mrs. Becker. I wouldn't mind seeing an iceberg, though, he continued. I'm told they're quite a sight. Another realist, another... um true life photograph of the Titanic in the dock and the caption right there says that as well. Chapter three, April 15th, 1912, 1230 AM. Ruth, Ruth, wake up. Where am I? Ruth wondered. She rubbed her eyes. Then she remembered she was on board the Titanic, but why did her mother sound so frightened? Get out of bed and put coats on the children, her mother continued. The ship has hit an iceberg. We're supposed to go up to the deck. Now Ruth was wide awake. She got out of bed and quickly dressed Marion and Richard. The Beckers left their cabin. In their hurry, they forgot their life belts. So 
So there's no caption here, which leads me to believe that this is one of the paintings of the Titanic. You can see the iceberg kind of off to the side. So this was um, right as the story is building with Ruth and her family. We're now going to see the paintings kind of reflect that. The family joined a group of passengers waiting to be led up to the boat deck. Some of them were fully dressed. Others, like Ruth and her mother, had coats over their nightclothes. It sounded just like the ship ran into gravel, one woman said. Everyone wanted to know more about what happened. Had the iceberg made a big hole? How serious was the damage? Was water flowing into the ship? A crewman arrived and took the passengers to the lifeboats. Women and children first, people shouted. Someone lifted Marion and Richard into lifeboat number 11. That's all for this boat, an officer said. Oh, please, let me go with my children, Mrs. Becker cried. A seaman helped her into the lifeboat, but Ruth was left behind. Ruth, her mother screamed, get in another boat. Ruth walked over to the next boat. May I get in, she asked an officer. He lifted her onto lifeboat number 13. It was so crowded that Ruth had to stand up. Lower away, the officer shouted. The boat dropped jerkily towards the sea. Ruth looked up at hundreds of passengers still on board the Titanic. There were not enough lifeboats for all of them. Ruth's boat reached the water safely, but no one knew what to do or where to go. The passengers on board asked one of the crew to be their captain. Row toward those lights in the distance. They might be the lights of a ship that could pick us up. Ruth looked back at the Titanic. Rockets went up from the ship, sending bursts of stars into the sky. These were distress single signals calling any other ships to come and help. The bow of the Titanic was sinking. Ruth looked at the people still on board. They were trying to move back towards the stern. The ship's lights went out. Suddenly, there was a loud noise like thunder. The Titanic broke apart. Ruth watched people leap into the sea. The bow disappeared under the water. For a minute, the stern stood straight up in the ocean. It looked like a huge whale. Then the Titanic dove beneath the waves. Chapter 4, April 15th, 1912, 3 a.m. The sea will be covered with ships tomorrow, said a crewman in Ruth's boat. They will race from all over to find us. The lifeboats from the Titanic drifted on the calm, cold ocean. The survivors tried to keep the boats together by calling out to one another in the dark. Ruth heard a rocket. In the distance, she spotted a faint green light. Could it be a rescue ship? Everyone in the boat who had a scrap of paper lit a match to it. They held these torches up high in the air. Maybe someone would see them. The passengers at the oars rowed towards the lights. They drew closer. They could see that the lights came from a large ship. Okay, we have another real photograph. Some of Titanic's passengers preparing to board the rescue ship from their lifeboat is what the caption says. So I'll hold that up while I read. The ocean became rough. Ruth was drenched by the cold, splashing water. Finally, the lifeboat pulled alongside the rescue ship. Crewmen on board lowered a swing down to the boat. Ruth's hands were too numb to grasp the ropes. Someone had to tie her into the swing. The crew pulled up her side of the ship. Its solid deck felt good beneath her feet. Ruth went up to the ship's open deck. Most of the lifeboats had come in, but there was no sign of her family. The Ruth, then Ruth felt a tap on her shoulder. Are you Ruth Becker? A woman said, your mother has been looking for you. She led Ruth to the second class dining room. Mrs. Becker, Marion, and Richard threw their arms around her and Ruth's eyes filled with tears of relief. The crew of the rescue ship, the Carpathia, searched the sea for several hours, but no more survivors were found. Several days later, the Carpathia arrived in New York City Harbor. Thousands of people waited in the pouring rain to greet the survivors. Ruth heard cries of joy from the people who had found their loved ones, but many others looked sad as they searched for family and friends 
who had drowned. Real life photograph, Titanic survivors in New York City. Chapter five, August 31st, 1985. Almost 75 years had passed since the Titanic sank, and now my team and I searched for the wreck. As each day went by, I wanted to find the lost ship more than ever. Our time was running out. We hadn't even seen a single sign of the wreck, and we sometimes wondered if the Titanic really did lie on the ocean floor. Late one night, Stu Harris pointed to the video screen. There's something. The sleepy crew looked at the screen. They could see pictures of man-made objects. A real-life photograph of the search ship, which is called the Noor. Bingo, Sue, Stu yelled. Argo's cameras picked up a huge boiler on the ocean floor. Boilers turned cold to drive a ship's engines. This had to be the one that belonged to the Titanic. Soon, we saw pieces of the railing and other wreckage. At last, my dream was about to come true. The Titanic must lie nearby. Everyone was shaking hands and slapping me and one another on the back. Someone noticed that it was 2 a.m., close to the time that the Titanic had sunk. We were excited but felt sad, too. We held a few moments of silence in memory of those who sailed on the great ship so long ago. Our first video ran over the wreckage with Argo was risky. We weren't sure whether the main part of the ship was. I was afraid that Argo might crash into it. So I'm going to get closer, but this first picture has a caption that says one of the Titanic boilers lying at the ocean floor. And then right next to that is another um, real picture, real photograph that says this is how big the boilers looked when they were in the ship. And then the bottom photograph is um, Robert Ballard celebrating finding the Titanic with his crew. All of a sudden, the huge side of the ship appeared. The Titanic was sitting upright on the ocean floor. Over the next few days, we made some important discoveries. The ship had broken into two sections. We saw large holes in the deck of the bow section where funnels had once stood. But at the end of our trip, many mysteries still remained. What did the ship look like inside? Where was the hole made by the iceberg? And what lay scattered on the ocean floor around the wreck? Only another visit to the Titanic would tell us what we wanted to know. Then we have a real life photograph. It says our um, underwater camera sled returns from photographing the Titanic more than 12,000 feet below the sea. Chapter 6, July 13th, 1986. A year later, we were ready to explore the Titanic from Alvin, our three-man submarine. I took off my shoes and climbed in. We were squeezed inside Alvin's tiny cabin. Soon we began our long fall to the ocean bottom. As we went down, it became colder and darker inside the little submarine. When Alvin reached the bottom, I peered out my window. Where was the Titanic? We could only see a short distance in the darkness of the deep ocean. The pilot turned Alvin and we glided along the ocean floor. I started out at the window. The bottom looked very strange. So we have some more real pictures. We have Robert climbing in to the submarine. And then we have the submarine getting lowered into the water. And the crew inside Alvin looking out the window on the ocean floor. So these are all real photographs that were um, taken when they were hunting for the Titanic. It seemed to slope sharply upward. My heart beat faster. Suddenly, an enormous black wall of steel loomed in front of us. It was the Titanic. The next day, we explored the bow section of the ship. The bottom part of the bow was buried in mud, but I could see the large anchor still hanging in place. We rose slowly up the ship's side. To my surprise, the glass in many of the portholes was not broken. I searched for the yellow letters spelling out the name Titanic, but they were covered with rust. Alvin began to move over the forward deck of the ship. Its wooden planks had been eaten away by millions of tiny sea worms. We passed over the bridge of the ship. From here, the captain and his officers, from where the captain and his officers had steered the Titanic. 
So then we have a real life photograph of what the Titanic looks like now under the water. And this book was written several years ago. So, and these pictures were taken in the 80s. So I can only imagine, I'm sure you can too, what that looks like now. It's probably a whole lot more rust and coral and little creatures growing on it than what is even in this picture. But that's still a very cool, descriptive, real photograph that Alvin was able to take. So that way we could have this information as a reader. We headed toward the grand staircase. Its big glass dome was gone. This would be the perfect place for our small robot, Jason Jr., to go inside this ship. Then we could take close-up pictures. The next morning, we landed Alvin near the opening to the grand staircase. At last, Jason Jr., or JJ, would see inside. JJ's pilot slowly guided our robot out of its little garage out the front of Alvin. JJ floated over the hole in the deck where the staircase had once been. The little robot went down into the ship, and we lost sight of it. We watched the video screen inside our submarine to see what JJ was looking at. Again, another real photograph because we have a caption. This is what the Titanic looks like sitting on the ocean floor. And that's the same picture that is on the cover of the book. Crazy how a something so big can look so small, even in a photograph. A room appeared on the screen. Look at that chandelier, JJ's pilot exclaimed. It was one of the light fixtures which had lit Ruth Becker's way up the grand staircase. The metal part of the light was still bright and shiny. We explored most of the great wreck over the next few days. JJ took a close-up look at the crow's nest. From here, the lookout had spotted the iceberg seconds before it hit the ship. We looked near the bow for the hole made by the iceberg, but it was covered with mud. I wondered what might lie on the ocean floor between the two parts of the wreck when the Titanic broke in two. Thousands of objects fell out. We found many of them still lying where they had fallen. It was like a huge underwater museum. Then we have more photographs. The top one, Alvin awaits while JJ explores the Grand Staircase. Then we have a picture of what the Grand Staircase looked like in 1912. And it says, today, coal sprouts, coral sprouts from one of the remaining light fixtures over the staircase. So again, just like in the picture um, a couple pages ago, coral and other living creatures have kind of inhabited this metal. Um, but it's that's what it looks like now. It's kind of been taken over. There were pots and pans, cups and saucers, boats, bathtubs, suitcases, and even a safe with a shiny brass handle. Before we left the Titanic, we placed two metal plaques on its decks. The one on the stern section is in memory of all the passengers who lost their lives. The plaque on the bow section asks anyone who visits the Titanic to leave it in peace. So here we have a picture of a rust-covered bathtub. And you can see some of the white. So there's a bathtub on the ship. Um, then we have the side of one of the benches that was out on the outdoor decks of the ship. And then there was this safe that still has its shiny handle. So even after being under the sea for all those years, some things are still intact. So it's really cool to see these um, real life photographs. And then here, it's kind of hard to see. I'll get it as close as I can. This says it is the remains of a um, porcelain doll or a china doll. And this was a really expensive toy back when the Titanic sank. And they were able to uncover that as well. And then we have an epilogue, which for those of you that aren't um, sure what that is, an epilogue is kind of a story after the story ends. So the story ends... It ended with them finding some artifacts, and then our epilogue um, is kind of a, by the way, after the story ends, this also happened. So epilogue um, says, I was sorry when our trips to the Titanic were finished, but I was proud of what we had done. We found the ship. We took many beautiful pictures of it. 
People all over the world would be able to visit the wreck when they saw JJ's pictures. They would think about the people who had sailed on the Titanic, those who had lost their lives as well as the survivors. Ruth Becker and her family had been lucky. Ruth grew up to become a teacher. She married and had three children. Like many Titanic survivors, Ruth wouldn't talk about the sinking. Her children didn't even know that she had been on the ship. So in this real life photograph, the robot JJ is taking a close up picture of one of the Titanic's anchors. So you can see it lighting it up there. And you can see from this angle of this photograph, how tall the ship um, stands and that's not even half of it. So even from that angle, you can see how big this ship really would have been and how big it was. She finally began to talk about her experience toward the end of her life. When she was 85 years old, Ruth saw pictures of the wreck on the ocean floor. When Ruth was 90, she went on her first sea voyage since the Titanic, and she died later that year. After our trip, another group of people went down to the Titanic. They brought up many things from the wreck, the ship's telephone and the bell from the crow's nest, some china, a leather bag full of jewelry, and money, hundreds and hundreds of other objects. I was very sad when I heard this. The Titanic should be left in peace as a monument to those who lost their lives on that cold, starry night so long ago. And that is the end. That This video um, and this reading was a little bit longer. I really wanted to show you guys the pictures. So I apologize that it was a little bit longer. Um, but I hope you guys enjoyed it. And if you want to see more Titanic books or more nonfiction books or historical books, um, make sure you comment or leave a book review so that way I can know that and we'll put some more in our channel or in our virtual library. So I hope you guys enjoyed this one. Very informative. I love all the pictures. Um, so I really liked it and I hope you guys did too. And I'll see you in the next one. Keep reading.